Welcome to Light Church Online. Thank you for joining us for today's Praise message. God. Well, have you said happy Thanksgiving to somebody yet? This time, I, I want you to have a blessed Thanksgiving. Say that right now. Yeah, I want you to have a blessed Thanksgiving. A blessed Thanksgiving. Well, just a word of exhortation today that actually starts with the description of the Thanksgiving meal. Just a few days, we're going to sit down with family and friends. And there's going to be some dishes that go untouched. Not because you don't like the person that prepared it. That's not it. You know, it's, 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 it's not that you don't like, uh, you know, Aunt Sally. It ain't that you don't like Aunt Sally. You just, you just don't like her dressing. <laughs> and the reason you don't like her dressing is not because Aunt Sally is a bad person. But it's the ingredients. Now, I, I think... Probably as you do, I think my mama is is a world class sweet potato pie baker. You want to know what sweet potato pie is supposed to taste like? You need to eat some of my mama's sweet potato pie. But I've had some sweet potato pie that didn't quite measure up. In fact. It's, it tasted like they left out the sweet. And in some cases, I think they left out the potato too. What I'm trying to help you see is that our enjoyment or pleasure from those dishes is not based on personality, but ingredients. I remember at Christmas time as a little boy, we gather around, you know, we get up early and go unwrap toys and stuff, you know, and, and there was always some toys. I, you know, I, I, I thought my father was a little strange because, man, we'd unwrap the toys and get ready to play. And you know what it was. Ain't no batteries. I can't play with this. You know, you have to kind of, you have to kind of make the thing is supposed to have a noise that comes out of it, but it requires batteries. And so, if the batteries weren't there, then we had to, we had to make the noise. Hum, hum, hum. You know, you know. I can't get a whole lot of joy out of that because the batteries were not included. And so I thought about that as the Lord spoke to me concerning this text in Philippians. We've heard it before, Philippians chapter 4. Uh, Yolanda did such an excellent job last week of bringing it up. So, so as I thought about it, he reminded me of what it was like to have toys where the batteries weren't included. What it's like to have a dish that looks good, but it's something missing. And you know, this ain't it. All right. Now, everybody's singing the praises of ain't Sally's this and ain't Sally's that, but this ain't it. And, and, and there may be times or may have been times when she was on it year before. I don't know, maybe she ran out of that ingredient. But you know, man, some, some, ain't, some ain't right about this one. This, ain't, this one ain't, ain't what it used to be. Listen to this verse. Verse 6, Philippians 4. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, here's the key, with thanksgiving. 
let your requests be made known to God. The God's word translation says, never worry about anything. But in every situation, how many? Every situation. We tend to think that just means when things are going bad. He says, in every situation, let God know what you need in prayers and requests. Because the King James says, in prayer and supplication. Prayer is the event. Supplication is the specific petition or request. So when he says prayer, he's, he, he's talking about the whole thing. In other words, you ought to always be praying. And in praying, let God know what your specific request is. But here's the key. Always include thanksgiving. Always include thanksgiving. So, so I'm going to ask you today to make the commitment from this moment on that no matter what situation you are facing, no matter what the circumstances may be, you are always praying in the midst of those. And that you never ever pray another prayer that doesn't include thanksgiving. Just like that dish can't be fully appreciated or enjoyed because an ingredient is left out. When we offer petitions to God and leave out the thanksgiving, how do we think he is supposed to enjoy our conversation? So thanksgiving has to be included. I don't care whether or not you're going to God bawling and squalling about something that happened to you, thanksgiving ought to be included. That's why I got, I got a, a person that uh, at, at a funeral one time, uh, years ago, they asked me, because the first thing I did was, I thank God. Well, this is a funeral. And? And I realized they didn't understand. How can I thank God when I'm at a funeral? Well, in the first place, I can think of a whole lot of reasons why you ought to thank God. Number one, because you ain't in the box. That ought to be obvious. But the time that you had with that person is a reason to thank God. People get up talking about she did this and he did this and I remember what, and oh, wasn't they fun and oh, they were such a lively person. Well, that's a cause to thank God. What if the person was mean and nasty? Never been to one of them kind of funerals though, but, but, but if the person was mean and nasty and folks, you know, didn't have a whole lot of good things to say about them, there's still a reason to include thanksgiving. All right, thank, thank God. You don't know everything about that person. Okay, what happened to make that person mean or nasty or turn south? in their disposition but we can thank God because in every situation God makes himself known so don't pray another prayer don't make another request of God that is missing that main ingredient instead of complaining which he told us last month to stop so stop it Complain about your husband, complain about your church, complain about this person, complain about your job. Stop it. We were reminded last week, in everything, give thanks. You can't, see, a person that's worried is not a thankful person. That's why he opens this verse up. By saying, don't worry about anything. Stop worrying about what they said. Stop worrying about what they said they were going to do. Stop worrying about you not having this, about you having this. Stop worrying about it and talk to God about it and let him know exactly what you desire. But don't ever go to God and leave out 
the main ingredient, which is thanksgiving. In the book of Philippians, it's a very, very special book because it is Paul writing a letter to encourage and give instructions to Christians who are being persecuted for their faith. And literally what he lays out for them and for us is how do you go through? He starts telling them stuff like, you need to change how you think. Let this mind be in you. In other words, stop thinking about the trouble and think about this. All right. But then there's a, a short prescription that he gives us when he comes to chapter 4 about how do you go through when you feel like you're being persecuted. Now, I got to tell you that, you know, we don't know nothing about being persecuted. You know, you think just because your husband criticized your cooking, you're being persecuted. That ain't persecution. That's just you can't cook. Very well. So maybe some cooking lessons. I'm just funning with you there. You know that, right? Maybe. But, but we don't really know. Not in this particular culture. We've been somewhat on the fringes of persecution based on our culture changing and having anti-Christian and anti-God sentiment. But even in the midst of whatever trouble we are dealing with, whatever storm we're dealing with, whatever crisis of offense we are dealing with, complaining is never the order of the day. In fact, when you look at this text, it starts out with a very, very emphatic, not suggestion, but instruction. Verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord. Come on. Always. Always. Not sometimes. Not just when things are going good. Not just when you're feeling well. Rejoice in the Lord. Always. Now again, he's writing this. This is one of the what is called the prison epistles. In other words, the man that's writing this is in lockup. And he's writing to a group of people who are experiencing true persecution because of their faith in Christ Jesus. And he says to them, I don't care what you're going through, rejoice. <laughs> rejoice. That wasn't good enough. You, you looking at verse 4? That, that wasn't good enough. Uh, it, rejoice in the Lord always. always. That, that wasn't good enough. That's right. okay, okay. I think if we were preaching this text today, we preachers would say, I don't believe you heard me. <laughs> Again, I say, yeah. rejoice. Yeah. Yeah. You got it? Let your gentleness be known to all men. You know, I said to uh, one of our leaders here recently, we were talking about some issues. I said, you can't be a leader and not be willing to confront. Okay, you can't lead if you don't, if you don't want to confront. If you're, not confront. if you're not confronting things that the Bible tells us we need to provoke people to love and the good work. So if I'm supposed to be your leader and I see you off track and see you going diametrically opposed to something God said you were supposed to be and I don't say anything, that is not an act of love. Even Jesus had to rebuke his disciples. But I said to them, you can confront without being confrontational. You follow what I'm saying? Now, some of y'all, bless your hearts, I, I believe God is the one that gave you your sharp tone. Because some of y'all can tell people you love them and sound like you just cussed them out. 
So what you're going to have to learn to do is start from the inside. Because that's where the real issue is. Okay, you just saying something is, is, not, is not enough to change the disposition or the demeanor of people. You got to change what's in your heart. And so, and so when he tells us that we ought to always rejoice and that we ought to be gentle in our handling one of another. Okay, because the Lord is at hand. All right, but then he comes to verse 6 and says, don't worry about anything. I like the connection between rejoicing always and don't worry about anything. And then the very next line is pray about everything. So you got always. Now I said always. Then you got nothing. Then you got everything. You get it? Always. Nothing. Everything. Now let's put them together the way the scriptures lined up. Rejoice. Always. Worry about. Nothing. Pray about. Everything. Now that's real simple, isn't it? Let your request be made known to God. But in your rejoicing. In you not worrying about it. In you praying about everything. Don't forget to include thanksgiving. Whatever your problems may be, in talking to God about it, don't forget to include thanksgiving. Lord, I thank you that I'm learning something about you in the midst of this. I thank you, Lord, that you have not abandoned me. I thank you, Lord, that as hard and as painful as this seems to be, your grace is sufficient. I thank you, Lord, it's not what I want, but you have not abandoned me. Even though what seems like to me, there have been a, an absence of your power and your presence. I thank you because I got a sure word from you that says you will never leave me and you will never forsake me. So I thank you even though I don't feel you, even though I don't see you, I thank you because I read it in your word that you are still with me. Don't you ever go before God and leave out the thanksgiving. Amen. Thanksgiving included. Thanksgiving included. Lord, I got a petition. But the thanksgiving is included. Lord, I got a problem, but the thanksgiving's included. Lord, I need to talk to you about this church, but the thanksgiving's included. Lord, you bless me, but the thanksgiving is included. I want to give back to you because you've given to me. So my thanksgiving is included. Do you realize that after every big event that happened in the life of Jesus, it was preceded by Jesus giving thanks? You stop and think about it. At the grave of Lazarus, for he even said, Lazarus, get up. You know what he did? He gave thanks. Oh, yes, he did. Moments before he would be arrested and tortured. Sitting around the table with a group of guys that was as clueless as you can get about what was going to happen. One of them already having plotted to betray him and sell him out for a few pieces of silver. And around that table, Jesus, before he would share his most intimate meal with these guys that would desert him, one having sworn, I don't care about what the other fellas do, but I'm never going to leave you. And Jesus would tell him about himself. But before he shared that wine and that bread, he gave thanks. Most amazing things happened. After Jesus gave thanks. He comes up to 
a crowd of 5,000. And then again, on another occasion, a crowd of 7,000. And the disciples are concerned that the people are going to get hungry and they're going to start eating their lunches. That, that's what the deal was. Because, you know, the disciples, you know, they always had provisions because they was, they was with Jesus. And so Jesus, you know, Jesus was a long preacher. All right, you, go, you didn't go to his meetings watching no clock. All right, but you didn't want to because you knew something was going to happen. Now, I don't know how long we got to stay here in order for something to happen, but we're going to stay here until it happens. And even if nothing else happens, at least we can get something to eat. All right, and so, and so what happens is when he sees that vast crowd of men, he says, look out and see how much we got to work with. And the disciples would come back and say, uh, there's, there's, not, there's, there's nothing here. There's a little boy here, but, but you know, his little lunch, Lord, you know, and, you know, come on, you know. And the Bible says Jesus told those disciples, go organize the people. And he took that little boy's lunch. And before distributing it, he gave thanks. Now, a professor of mine, I think I mentioned this to you before. A professor of mine, when, when uh, we were going over that particular miracle, suggested to us that our perception of what Jesus did and that whole episode was seriously flawed. Because for most people, they think that Jesus just kept breaking off the same piece of bread and it just kept it just kept multiplying so you know here's one slice and another slice pop up and here's one slice and another slice pop up and here you know well I mean you know to the untrained to, to the, and that could have happened because we know that Jesus was a miracle worker but there was a greater miracle that took place and when he said that, it dawned on me, I've been looking at this thing all wrong. Because it is very unlikely that that many men and women would gather together and would be prepared to spend that amount of time and not have prepared some kind of lunch. But the miracle he suggested that really took place was not the miracle of the multiplication of the bread and the fish. The miracle took place in the hearts of those who were stingy when Jesus asked, what do we have to help those that don't have food to eat? And none of them stepped up can you imagine that not one man stepped up and say hey we brought extra we can we can share none of them did that and the miracle actually took place when Jesus used the little boy's lunch to open up the hearts of people who were closed fisted that I suggest is a greater miracle because what transforms the heart is the thanksgiving that Jesus gives. And when Jesus gave thanks, all of a sudden, heaven's resources opened up. I tell you, you got to include the thanksgiving. And so before you sit down to pay any bill, no matter how high the stock may look, and how low the money may look, before you send anything to any utility company, or to any mortgage company, or to any landlord, you ought to say, Lord... I thank you. I thank you. And, and instead of looking for a check in the mail, perhaps the grace of God will move on those that you owe to say, well, we can forgive you for this and, and we can write this off and we can move this payment to the end of the note. But you have to include the thanksgiving. If the thanksgiving is left out, how do you expect the Father to enjoy what you offer? Always. Always include the Thanksgiving. Let me, let me, let me shut this down. Let me, let me help you with this very simple, very simple practice. Three things that 
we as Christians must absolutely practice. Number one, we just read it. We ought to always practice rejoicing. We ought to always practice rejoicing. So right now, we're going to do a test run. We're going to do a test run of you rejoicing. I don't believe you heard me. I say rejoice. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Lord. This is a day that you have made. And I am going to rejoice and be glad in it. The weather ain't got nothing to do with it, Lord. My situation got nothing to do with it. This is a day that you have made and I rejoice in this day. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. You, Lord, are my shepherd. I shall not lack. Oh, I rejoice today, Lord God. You are the God of my salvation. That's just a test run. That's just a test run. Now, let me, let me, let me help you a little bit with your rejoicing. That was, a, that was just a test run. But, but, but you're going to do better than that in the real run. You're going to do better than that. What I mean by that is, you know, if you are ashamed to praise and to rejoice over God's goodness in what Jesus called a wicked and perverse generation, how do you expect him to, to own you? among the righteous so when you are rejoicing I mean man you know if you in your own shower what you care about who listening if you in your own car are y'all listening to me what you care about it it's your car ain't it can't you do what you want in your car it's your tub it's your shower can't you say what you want and be as loud as you want in your shower I don't suggest that you dance in the shower that could lead to some other issues but rejoice always that's that's something that we must practice it must be a way of life for us we're not complainers we are rejoicers I'm rejoicing in the Lord secondly we got we to gotta always pray. Jesus spoke a whole parable that had that in mind. Yes, yes. Men ought to always pray and not quit. Why haven't you talked to God about that issue you've been wrestling with? All right, all right. You've been trying to get over it, get over the offense. You've been trying to deal with the storm. You've been trying to deal with the trouble. And not once have you gone to him and ask him, Lord, how do you want me to handle this? You've been trying to figure it out in your own mind. Prayer has to be a way of life for us. So we ought to always pray. Always talk to God. I don't care how puny or how little or how sinful you may feel over some of the foolish things that you have done. I had an aunt that uh, one, of, one of my mothers, in fact, it was, I think she was the baby girl. And she was very colorful, very colorful. She married a guy that was military. And uh, they were stationed out in El Paso, what is that, Fort, Fort, come on military, in, in El Paso. Fort Bliss, he was a sergeant out there for years. And he had a sister, very, very, I don't know if you would call her devout when I tell you what she did, but she's, she's a Christian. Okay. She was a serious Christian. And her job was really demanding. Every day, she would come home, get her a silver, y'all know what a silver bullet is? Okay, if you don't know, go look it up. 
get her a silver bullet, sit on the table, pop the top, and say, Lord, Lord, I just thank you. I've had a long day, but I just thank you for this cold. <laughs> I'm saying what she did for this cold, and she named it. Only reason I ain't naming it because ain't, they ain't paying me no money to advertise their product. But anyway, she did that every day. She thanked God that He gotten her through the day. And she sat down to rest with a cold one. <laughs> Where do we get off thinking that our sin should keep us away from God? You might have just gotten up from sleeping with somebody you got no business in the bed with. So put your clothes on, kneel down on the side of that bed, and thank God that that wasn't your last night. Amen. And get yourself up Amen. out of that place and get to the house of God and thank him again that at least the devil wasn't able to wipe you out in your foolishness. Don't you ever think that number one, God's not there because that's not what he said. And don't you ever think that your sin is too bad that you can't go to him with it. Christians ought to practice praying about everything. Lord, I did this. It was wrong. You said it was wrong. I knew it was wrong. But Lord, I just, I just, I did it. So I thank you, first of all, that you've not abandoned me, that you are still with me. You're still my father. I thank you that you made forgiveness and cleansing available to me. So you got to practice. You can't just live a life doing wrong and just going like you ain't done it. And lastly, you ought to always practice being thankful. Always practice thanksgiving. Always, always include in whatever conversation you have with the Lord. In whatever situation you're dealing with, always include thanksgiving. Go ahead and stand with me. Life is a race. But you don't have to run it alone. Take advantage of your help. Receive Jesus today, and he will help you with everything you're going through. God has a plan for you. The first step in that plan is salvation. Read Romans 10 and 9 and pray this prayer of salvation. God in heaven, I believe in my heart. You raised Jesus from the dead. I confess with my mouth, Jesus is the Lord. Jesus, I call on you now for my eternal salvation. I receive forgiveness for all my sin. I accept your unconditional love. Thank you for receiving me. I submit myself to you. With you as my helper, I will live according to your plan the rest of my life. Amen. If you are blessed by today's message, we encourage you to give an offering. Simply click the Give Online link on the Light Church homepage. Thank you for tuning in this week. We look forward to you joining us during our next broadcast. Have a blessed week.